There are really 23 verses that we did not cover. We covered Daniel's 70th week, 70 weeks uh, in, with two messages, but there are these uh, 23 verses in the ninth chapter that we'll look at this evening, appropriate for this evening. And there are just some things here that we can learn from Daniel's prayer. Daniel's praying. Verse number one, in the first year, of Darius, the son of Azahurus, uh, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces, as at this day, to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and unto all Israel that are near and that are far off, through all the countries whither thou hast driven them because of their trespass that they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belong confusion of face to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belongeth, or belong mercies and forgivenesses though we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his law, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us. And the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. And he hath confirmed his words, which he spake against us and against our judges that judge us, judged us by bringing upon us a great evil. For under the whole heaven had not been done as hath been done upon Jerusalem. As it's written in the law of Moses, all this evil has come upon us, yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. Therefore, hath the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he doeth. For we obeyed not his voice. And now, O Lord, our God that hath brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and has gotten thee renown, as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Now therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications, and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. O my God, Incline thine ear and hear. Open thine eyes and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousnesses, but for thy great mercies. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake. O my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. And whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sins of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, 
Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me, talked with me, and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, I, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. The ninth chapter contains the vision of the 70 weeks of years of prophecy that God gives uh, foretelling about what he's going to do with Israel. It tells God's plan for the Jews uh, as a people and as a nation. We already looked at that prophecy last Sunday, but uh, we tonight want to look in this message at some things that led up to that revelation that God gives him. And what we find here is a, a special work of God in his heart. First thing that we note is that Daniel, he's studying God's Word. It said in verse 1 and 2, Daniel is studying God's Word. We're told when he studied. We're told what part of God's Word he studied. When was it that he studied? Well, it says, verse 1, the first year of Darius in his reign. That would have been 538 B.C., now, there's an interesting thing here. That means that year, Darius reigned one year. That means that year that this event occurs, Daniel's 70 week of years is given to him, this ninth chapter. We're also told that that's the same year that Daniel's put in the lion's den. We're also told that Daniel chapter 5 occurred that year. That is that Darius conquers Babylon and takes it. And the mini mini tickle, all of that. So chapter 5, chapter 9, chapter 6 are all in that same year, period. And he just reminds us that all of that took place. You say, well, what's that got to do with anything? I don't know. <laughs> it's just I thought it was interesting. The time factor. Uh, but what part of God's word was he studying? Well, we're told in the passage, verse 2, it said he's studying Jeremiah. Apparently, the book of Jeremiah, the writings of Jeremiah, were brought with them to Babylon, and they're reading uh, that writing. Not only are they reading Jeremiah's writings, but it says books, plural, which I think, understanding all that's going on, he must have also had Isaiah. And Jeremiah. And because there's truths there that tell when this 70 year captivity is going to be over. When they will return. And he knows by the date that it's getting close. It's within a couple years. Daniel now up there toward the 90 mark knows that Cyrus is going to give opportunity according to Isaiah. Cyrus is going to tell them they can go back and rebuild. And so he gets it. Jeremiah tells very clearly a couple of passages. Jeremiah 25, 11, Jeremiah 29, 10. Those passages tell us that it would be 70 years that they are in captivity. So he reads and he knows and he gets and he understands. I tell you, it's important to read the Bible. Right? He reads the Word of God, Holy Scripture. The other passage would be Isaiah 44 and 28, which tells of Cyrus. It's amazing that God gave Isaiah word about who was going to be ruling before the ruler was ever born. Cyrus, the king. You say, oh, they just wrote that in there later. No, 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 that's not so. I'm telling you, the book of Daniel, if it teaches anything, it teaches over and over again that you can have confidence in God because he foretells the future. And you can have confidence in God's word because it is precise and accurate in everything that it predicts. I've told you before that before I got saved, three years before I got saved, I, I read a book that 
made me face these prophecies about Christ's first coming. And that firmed in my heart that the Bible was a miracle book. Three years before I ever got saved. God used prophecy. God used this fact that God predicts future and is precise in fulfilling it. That's why whenever the Bible says Jesus is coming a second time, I have no problem with it. He fulfilled and proved all of these prophecies in His first coming. You can count on it. He's going to come again, just like He said. You said it hadn't happened yet. Nope, but it's going to. You can count on it. Rest assured, He's already verified Himself in a thousand ways, a thousand times plus in Old Testament prophecy. Verifying it. So, Daniel understood. He, one of the things that he would have understood was why they were taken into captivity. They were taken because they had disobeyed God's ordinance about the land. That's one of the reasons. They were taken because of idolatry. See, every seventh year... In the covenant with the nation of Israel, they were to make sure and leave the land alone. Not plant, not harvest for a year. And just like God did with the manna in the Old Testament in the wilderness wandering. On that, six, on that sixth day, he gave double so that they had plenty for the seventh day. He did the same thing and the harvest would have done the same thing if they had just obeyed him. In that sixth year, he would have given double harvest and they'd have been fine for the seventh year. Because God said, I want you to, it's got to be to lay by for that seventh year, a Sabbath year. And they disobeyed it and disobeyed it and disobeyed it and disobeyed it. So what did God say? He said, all right, because you wouldn't obey that, you wouldn't let the land lie like what it really comes down to, it's not that important, the land lying. I know it, nutrition and all of that kind of stuff. I mean, or uh, minerals, all the kind of stuff, nutriment that's needed in soil. But it's not so much that. It's the matter of trusting. They had to learn to trust him. He's in the business of developing us, uh, trust in us, so that we can learn that he can be trusted. See, if God gave double harvest in the sixth year and they made it through that seventh year, that first time they did it, they said, this is going to be all right. God can be trusted. But they wouldn't. And so God said, okay, you won't let the land lie. I'll take you out of it. And it'll lie for 70 years. Not only that, you're so interested in idols. I'm going to take you to a land that is just absolutely flooded full of idolatry and idols. And you're going to get to the place that you are sick up to here with idolatry. And they were. When they came out of the captivity, we are told in Holy Scripture that they were done with idolatry. God broke them in the whole event. So, you, you can save yourself a lot of trouble and heartache if you just obey God. Do what He said. By the study of Scripture, Daniel came to see and understand where he was on God's prophetic clock. I, I wonder, do we see where we're at? He, he sees on the prophetic clock where, where he's at. Do we see? All I have to do is read Revelation 3 and I see a Laodicean church who is rich and increased with goods and thinks they have need of nothing and everything's going swimmingly well and we can just get by just fine. We don't need God. We don't need to do much of anything. We can, we can create our own success in Christianity. We don't need a visit from God. We don't need divine intervention. We can make our own disciples. We can get people into the family of God our own way. 
See, we've got all of this. Rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Don't need God. That's the kind of, you, you know, that's the last church depiction before we go into tribulation period, before the second coming of Christ. We're in a Laodicean type age. They'll depart from the faith and give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. There is a mass departure from the faith. And when I say that, I mean among those who are churchgoers and I mean those in Christendom who still claim to know Christ. But the Word of God is not their authority anymore. It's the culture or something. Whatever's the latest fad. Whichever direction society and the majority are going. Daniel saw where he was at on the prophetic clock. You know, we, we can look. Israel's back in the land. That has not occurred. That's occurred in my lifetime. Knowing that there are definite end time prophetic truths about them being back in the land. Instead of being scattered among the nations. So we see... We're not date setters, but we are sign seers. We can see some things. Things are lining up more than they've ever lined up. Matthew 16, 3, Jesus reprimanded the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He said, you can discern the weather, but you cannot discern the signs of the times on God's prophetic calendar. Oh yeah, you can go out here. You can tell just by how what the sky looks like the night before what the next morning's bringing. Right? You're sailors. You've seen it. You've got it scheduled. You've already got the... You can detect all that kind of stuff. But what about the things of God? So, Daniel studied God's Word. I love it. He's a 90-year-old who's still studying his Bible. You gotta love it. Wonder, the older we get, are we? Are we studying our Bible? We ought to be. Certainly ought to be. Second truth in the passage. Not only Daniel's study of God's word, I see Daniel's time of prayer. In verse 3 through 19, Daniel prays, and he's got a two-part prayer. Two parts. There's penitent prayer and there's petitioning prayer. It, again, I can't overemphasize that it was the truths of God's Word that prompted Daniel to pray. That's why we ought to read the Word and let it give us the burden. Let it drive us to God, to talk to God, and to pray. Not only that, if you'll study your Bible, if you'll read your Bible, you'll be, better understand what the will of God is so that you can be praying the will of God. Right? Praying scripturally. Instead of praying like some of these nuts that are just concerned about stuff that God isn't even about. Look at it. Verse 3, his focus. And I set my face unto the Lord. Daniel turned toward the Lord. He's focused on the Lord. He's turned his attention toward the Lord. He's turned his attention away from other things. To focus on the Lord. And I set my face unto the Lord God. And then his fervency. To seek by prayer. That, he's go that is to say he's going after God. He's going after something until he finds him. Until he finds it. He's seeking after God by prayer. And then I would say that it wasn't just a, a little short brief thing because it said with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. That speaks of course the, of the seriousness of his heart. The humility before God. 
but it also shows us that he was willing to take time. You do understand that you don't fast in 15 minutes, right? Oh yeah, I'm fasting. And then after about 20 minutes, I'll tell Diana, will you please get me a piece of pie? That's not fasting. Fasting takes time. He's seeking God. I mean, he's seriously seeking God for extended period of time to get some answers, to get some help from the Lord. And then I see his fellowship. Verse 4 says, And I prayed unto the Lord my God, unto capital L-O-R-D, Jehovah, the covenant name of God, the God who promises, and then also God, my God, Elohim, that is the powerful God, the creator name of God, and it's personal relationship. I prayed unto the Lord my God. He's having personal fellowship with the true and living God. Several things about him, about the true and living God's mentioned. It says that he's great. It says that he's a dreadful God. That is one who is to be feared. He's holy and he judges sinners. And we are sinners. <laughs> so it's, he's the dreadful God. And then not only that, but he keeps the covenant. And mercy unto those that love him and to them that keep his commandments. He gives all this list about how God, what God's like. So look at the two things, a penitent prayer and petitions in prayer. Penitent prayer, verse 5 through 15, it's a prayer of confession to God. If, if you look at these numbers, 72% of Daniel's prayer is a confession of sin. He spends a lot of time in the praying, and, and we read it. And you're going through there and he's just confessing sin and he's confessing disobedience and all the different words that are used to describe how sin works and what sin is. And he's talking to God for 72% of his prayer time. And then it's like at the end, then he finally asks something. The first part's just confessing. And what's amazing to me is Daniel's one of the most upright persons found in Scripture. Not one mention of any failure. You can go to David and you can find a failure. You can go to Simon Peter and find a failure. You can go to the Apostle Paul and find failure mentioned. Not Daniel. Not a word mentioned about him. Any negatives about him mentioned in Scripture. And yet, he's praying... Just exactly like he's the biggest wretch that ever walked the planet. It's just the characteristic of the child of God in the presence of God. I would also mention that he's identifying with his people. He, he uses the word we and us over and over again. He's identifying with the nation of Judah. And the people. He doesn't justify or excuse himself. He doesn't bring up his faithfulness. <laughs> You'd think that if there was somebody who might, when they pray, say, Now, Lord, you know I've done this and that and something else, and I've been faithful. And he didn't go down the Pharisee prayer path where he said, Lord, you know I'm glad I'm not like the publican over there. He, that wasn't his praying at all. He's penitent in his praying. He's praying, confessing guilt. Confessing that the nation has been guilty. In just verse number five, we read one, two, three, four, five. We, we read five words that describe sin. Just in one verse. He said, we sinned, iniquity, wickedly, rebelled, departed. Verse 6 says, not hearkened. Verse 7, trespass. Verse 10, not obeyed. Verse 11, transgressed thy law. 
we saw some of those all of some of the meanings of those terms but he's just encompassing all of it saying here's what we are we've got sin and a dictionary of definitions about what we've been about and what we've done and what we've been up to and what we haven't done that we should have done confession is simply agreeing with God there's where the breakdown is with us isn't it we don't agree with God about disobedience if we confess our sins he's faithful and just to forgive us cleanse us right but you have to get to the place that you'll agree with God about it and the truth of the matter is we don't think that it's so bad and so what do we do we wind up excusing it making our little excuses excuses minimizing sin oh uh, I goofed I, I, I blew it I made a mistake I, I made a boo-boo. My bad. Slap on the back. A little guilty giggle. We tend to minimize it. Daniel doesn't see sin as a light offense, but he sees it as a great offense against God. And to prove it, there has been 70 years of ripping of families apart, 70 years of deportation, 70 years under the thumb of evil Gentile rulers sin brings punishment doesn't it has its consequences l let me just read a spot sentence here there throughout it verse 7 though all the countries whither thou hast driven them because of their trespass against thee where thou hast God's driven them because of their trespass it said verse 8 speaks of confusion that's on them. verse 11 yea all Israel have transgressed thy law even by departing that they might not obey the voice therefore the curse is poured upon us see it God said here's where you are right now you're in such a condition that I'm pouring curse on you instead of blessing I'm just pouring it out and we, we love to talk about how God pours out the blessing but there is a connection between obeying and surrendering and repenting and blessing but there's also a connection with disobedience and rebellion and curse God bringing curse absence of blessing Verse 12, bringing upon us a great evil. Verse 13, all this evil has come upon us, yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities. No repentance, no praying, no doing business with God. They didn't pray. Even after the, the, all of the trouble and difficulty and chastening hand of God came. Verse 14, therefore hath the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us. God has brought it upon us. We have sinned. We have done wickedly, he says in verse number 15. So, 72% of the prayer is confession of sin. It is a penitent prayer by Daniel. Somebody calling on God for a nation, for a people. 
and Daniel's the one. Secondly, there's the petition in the prayer, verse 16 through 19. Daniel makes a request. He asks for something. What does he ask for? What's he ask for? Verse 16. Look at it. O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away. There's a good place to start. Lord, I know that we've made you mad. And we deserve what you have given us. And that is a trip to the woodshed. But could you turn away? There's the petition. Turn away from thy city, Jerusalem. Fury be turned away. Not him, but the fury be turned away from the city of Jerusalem, thy holy mountain. Because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers. Because it says thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. He's wanting this reproach lifted. They, they have become a joke. You hear me? The, the city, nations, peoples around them have looked at them and said, Ha! They, 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 they claim they got a God. Ha! Look how they... They don't, they're not concerned about doing what that book said. <laughs> and they became a reproach. Oh, it's a wonderful thing when the children of God will get to the place that they're burdened about God's reputation in things. What, how's this going to reflect on God? What I'm doing, how's it going to reflect how are people going to think about God in me doing this, that, or something else? That's the right question to ask always. You say, well, I'll live my life. I don't have to do anything for anybody else. That's a lie. If, you're, if your heart is after God, you will be concerned about His reputation. His honor. And Daniel is. Let thine anger and fury be turned away from thy city. He's praying for God to favor them again. Verse 17. Now therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications, and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. This, the, they're a reference to the house of God. It sure enough is desolate. It's not even it's not even built anymore yet, right? You doesn't get any more desolate than that. God's tore it down because it becomes such a reproach. And he said. Let thy face, cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary. That's the prayer. Lord, could you, would you look on us with uh, favor? I wonder, I wonder how the Lord's looking on us. I, I know we could, I, I know we could talk about, wonder how the Lord's looking on Liberty University. After the Falwell mess. What a tragedy. A school that started with fundamental foundation. Preaching the truth of the gospel. To the world. When nobody else was preaching. That early burden. Men like B.R. Lake and on the television set pleading with souls for their eternity now such a playing games becoming millionaires we can do whatever we want to I can play games with my pool boy if I want to 
without any regard for God. And his reputation. Just so I can have my little kicks in life. And that kind of thing had been going on in Jerusalem before this 70 years took place. That kind of thing. And now, here after 70 years of discipline, Daniel's coming to pray and he's saying, Lord, could, you sh could your face shine on your sanctuary again? Could you, could you look down at the house of God with favor one more time? Could you visit us and be with us among us again? That's his burden. That's his prayer. It ought to be ours. I know it would be easy just to kick at Liberty University crowd, but what about us? The message here is for us. What about us? Is there any burden in your heart to pray for God to manifest Himself? For God to work in power in our lives? For God to do something real? Hear the prayer of thy servant and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate. He says, look at verse 18, the last part of verse number 18. He said, for we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousnesses, but for thy great mercies. And he comes and makes sure that he confesses before the Lord that it's not our merits. He knows that he merits nothing. It's mercy that he's pleading for. We ought to be pleading for mercy in our day. That God would look down on us and have mercy upon us. Get, give us what we don't deserve. Wipe out our offenses that have been built up against him. He said. Verse number 19. He asked for forgiveness. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. It's a simple prayer. But you have to mean it. It has to be more than just talk. Right? Lord, I'm wanting you to take this dirty disobedience out of my heart. Forgive me. I want the channel between, the fellowship between you and I to be open. Not the heavens are brass. Give us a breakthrough. He's not praying about Cadillacs and million dollar mansions and big high paying jobs and he's not, that's not what he's paying, praying about that's not what he's about he's about spiritual stuff isn't he spiritual stuff I love, I love how over and over here there's an emphasis on how that everything belongs to God. Here's a man who knows that God owns it all. L listen to how it's put throughout these verses. Verse 16, he speaks of thy righteousness, thine anger, thy fury, thy city, Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, thy, he's talking to God, thy people. Verse 17, thy servant, thy sanctuary verse 18 thine ears thine eyes the city which is called by thy name thy great mercies verse 19 for thine own sake thy city thy people called by thy name 
He just acknowledges that this all belongs to God. And preeminently, he's saying, in all of these areas, places, people, I'm interested in thine glory. That your name, your reputation, God's reputation, it, it's a pitiful thing to have God written on something and disregard how it reflects on him. Like the name Christian is on us. We wear his name. So we should be concerned about his reputation in all that we are and do. A final truth. Daniel studies God wor God's word. Daniel spends time in prayer. Verse 20 to 23. Daniel gets a visit from heaven. The Lord sends Gabriel, an angelic creature, to teach Daniel and to touch Daniel. Look at verse number 20 and following. While I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord God for the holy mountain of my God. Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, and it's not a mere man, it's an angelic creature, Gabriel the angel, they always come in male manifestation throughout Scripture. It said, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, me about the time of the evening, evening oblation again I mentioned this morning about the time of the evening oblation here he is over in Persian world <laughs> and yet he's still thinking about they still got in his mind oh yeah the, the sacrifices were made at this time of the day this evening oblation was made and so he's praying at that time of day because it's normal because he's thinking about, oh yeah, the blood substitute sacrifice covers the sins and all and you got to have it. And so he's thinking about all of that even though it's not going on. After 70 years in captivity, he's still living that way with God and God's ways in his mind. And he gets... The touch from heaven. We looked at it this morning in the 10th chapter. Three times. Daniel got a heavenly touch in the 10th chapter. We need a heavenly touch. You say, oh, you're getting mystical on me. No, no. It's biblical. We need a heavenly touch. A touch from heaven. Of his sweet person and power in our lives. Verse 22. And he informed me. Not only touched him, he taught him. He informed me and talked with me. And said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. That is unbelievable. God's going to give him the ability, skill, to understand the ability to pen Holy Scripture. Right? God, you'll have to have it. It'll take God's given enablement to be able to understand.
what God wants in your life. I've, I've, I've heard preachers through the years. You have too. Who said, oh, you don't need any call of God to go preach. Just get at it. God told us to preach. Just get at it. Well, where did they get that from? I know we're all witnesses. But particular pastoral ministry or evangelism and all those kind of things, that's something different. There's a call of God about it. So you don't just start in. We need, we need to be informed from heaven. We need to understand because heaven's given us understanding about what he wants for us. For your life. Verse 23, And at the beginning of thy supplications the commandment came forth, and I came to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved, therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. And so God comes, and really we could say just like we did this morning, have you had any special experiences with God? Special meetings with God? We have it here again in the ninth chapter. Heaven coming and interacting with an intercessor and a repenter. One who's praying. One who's seeking God. We do need divine intervention. We do need God to visit on a wide scale. But more than that, you need God to visit in a personal way to you individually in your heart tonight. And the passage does closely connect with Second Chronicles 7.14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. That's exactly what Daniel is praying about all those things. Let's stand tonight. Seventy two percent of the prayer was penitent not petitions asking God for a lot of stuff no it's just owning up just laying his heart open bare unveiling it so that God here I am here's what I am here's what I am here's what we are here's what we need Lord only you can forgive us only you can fix us Only you can power us. Lord, we need heavenly stuff. Heavenly promptings. Heavenly teachings. Heavenly touch. Has all this become a burr under your saddle? Let me tell you, it did, Daniel.
sin abounding made him serious before God. Confessing and petitioning God. Seeking God's face. Asking for God to shine His favor on His people, on His house, on His family. I love it that he's praying at the evening oblation. Daniel certainly understood that it was a substitutionary blood sacrifice death of someone else to be able to cover his sins. Here he is, 90 years of age, still at that hour of the day, no doubt remembering it whenever he was a kid, taught it by his folks probably. Now we're going to take an animal, slit his throat. Something's going to have to die so you can live. Blood will have to be shed so you can be forgiven. All prefiguring the Son of God at Calvary's cross. Sacrifice has been made. Forgiveness can be obtained. Favor of God can come to you. His face can shine on you. time it's all said and done you can be like Daniel you can hear from heaven oh my beloved you're greatly beloved you're greatly beloved he said message from heaven said you're greatly loved God greatly loves you Scott dismisses tonight.